mass and energy and general relativity. Thank you. So I can see that he was sleeping during one of my lectures because he thinks that the second one. <laughs> 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 so uh, let me remind you where we uh, ended yesterday. So there's something called SCE, scalar constraint equation, which says that the Ricci scalar of a Riemannian metric, we're looking at initial data, so, so we have a surface sigma, uh, which has an induced metric and an extrinsic curvature tensor. So the Ricci scalar of this metric is equal 16 pi rho, rho being uh, defined through the energy momentum tensor as in this way. So this is the geometric way of saying this is the energy density coming from matter fields on this surface. Uh, so the n mu is the normal vector to this, uh, to the surface. Uh, if you have a space time, well, if you don't, then this is the starting point to get one. K is this famous uh, extrinsic curvature tensor, and one way of writing it is as follows. It's a symmetric, obviously, tensor. It uses this normal vector and mu, and it's just some kind of space derivatives of this uh, vector. So this is the norm square of this vector. This is a trace and perhaps a cosmological constant if you have one. So this is the scalar constraint equation. And Vc being the vector constraint equation, divergence of a specific tensor here is uh, this one. Uh, so I got uh, confused by Rick's lecture today because he wrote a plus here. Uh, you can get away with a plus or minus by changing the orientation of this n vector. So he didn't write anything wrong. He didn't just tell you what is the orientation he's using. But this is a very painful sign if you're writing a paper and you want to have your conventions correct and then you just end up with something which is minus what you expect it to be. So, to the best of my knowledge, uh, this is the right sign if n is future directed. Right? Of course, if you change the sign of the normal, then the sign changes here. Of course, what, in what Rick was saying, the dominant energy condition is that the length of this vector is smaller than this number, then the sign doesn't matter. And, uh, uh, but uh, that's the vector constraint equation for me anyway. Uh, we kind of derived this uh, formula, or at least I showed you how you get it from the scalar curvature, that this is essentially, a, you collect the second derivatives of the metric which are here in this expression, write them as a divergence, and you call this the mass period. So it looks completely arbitrary, but the point was that if you assume that the metric has a asymptotic so that it goes to a flat one at a uh, rate with so r to some power, and its derivative go a little bit faster. Well, a little bit mean one more. Uh, and if the integral of the scalar curvature is finite, and this rate is alpha one half, then this is well defined. Okay. And I also showed you that you allow one half here, hell breaks loose. Uh, Good, and uh, so uh, this is a metric uh, all of you know. This is the Schwarzschild metric. I didn't dare writing it uh, last time. I didn't want to offend you, but now I'm writing it to make sure that we agree that this number here is actually what you're going to get if you take this metric, which plug it in here. And uh, obviously, so uh, we're looking only at the space part of the metric, so it's sitting here. And if I look at this part of the metric, so I can make a Taylor expansion of this as one. Well, if you expand one minus x, you get one plus x. So one plus two m over r plus lower order terms. So if you have a metric written in this form, then 
you immediately know what the mass is by looking at this, right? So one has to be a little careful. There's a change of sign, right? If you have it in the denominator, you pull it up, you have a change of sign. So let's uh, start with a simple exercise uh, in the same spirit as the ones we've been doing before, playing with this exponent alpha 1 half. So we go to Minkowski, and we introduce a new time tau, which is t plus a square root of r, where a is a constant. So again, this exponent 1 half is showing up. Now it's positive. So uh, let's rewrite the Minkowski metric. So we go from t r, at r theta phi to coordinates tau r theta phi. So uh, the Minkowski metric, I like to write it as eta. Uh, so minus dt square plus dr square plus r square d omega square. So we have to substitute for t this expression. So this is minus d tau plus, well, let me just do it slowly. At the beginning of the lecture, I have to warm up as well. So t minus a square root of r, the whole square, plus whatever follows. Uh, good. So let's do this calculation. So this is minus dt derivative of square root, yes? Is something wrong? Good. Thanks. What did I do wrong again? <laughs> Now, this is not Schwarzschild. This is. Well, oh, come on. This is a two, right? <laughs> Just, I mean, you can come here. <laughs> I agree that's not the greatest two I've ever written. But, <laughs> but look, this is the same two as here, right? <laughs> uh, Good. Thanks. Good. So, so that is d tau, OK? Now, you know, differentiate square root. I'm going to get, well, a minus a over 2, 1 over square root, dr square plus dr square plus r square d omega square. Good. So minus d tau square, that's easy. This double product with a minus becomes a plus, and the two vanishes. Plus a d tau dr over square root of r. And then this guy, square root is squared, becomes 1 over r. So when I collect the dr terms, I get 1 from here. And the square of this gives me a square over 4 with a minus over r, minus a squared over 4, r, r squared plus r squared, d omega squared. So this is my Minkowski metric in this coordinates. I mean, nobody tells me to use these coordinates. It's a stupid idea. But nobody would going to prevent me to use them if I want to, right? So now you look at this metric, and you say, well, it's a bit of a funny metric, but it's still, if I go to infinity, this goes to 0, right? So this goes to 0, this goes to 0. So in, this goes to a Minkowski metric, at large distances. There's no question about it. And now if I look at the surface tau equals 0, the surface tau equals 0 means I drop this term, means I drop this term. So this is my induced metric on the surface tau equals 0, right? Well, what is the mass? This is my formula here, right? If you have a metric which is 1 plus something over r plus lower order, then this something over r is actually 2 mass, right? So the mass is minus uh, a square of 8 or something like that. a square of 8. So. Does it make any sense? I mean, so, so this is really a surface in Minkowski spacetime, right? Minkowski spacetime should have zero mass, right? 
doesn't. But I've been explaining to you that a metric like that has a well-defined mass, right? There's no issue about this. This has a well-defined mass. As long as you stay within the right system of coordinates, that's what you're going to get, right? So something unphysical is going on, right? So mathematically, that's what I did. But physically, you'd say, well, there's something physically wrong, yeah? Because I should get, if I take a reasonable slice in Minkowski space-time, I should get zero mass. Because zero mass should be a property of a space-time, uh, well, you would hope at least. Uh, and so what goes wrong? Uh, well, certainly the scalar curvature of this, you can check, goes to zero very fast because it has the same asymptotics as the Schwarzschild. So, so, so this condition, wait, okay, maybe this condition will not be satisfied, right? So uh, if we look at the scalar constraint, certainly lambda is zero. Uh, certainly, rho is zero in Minkowski, right? So t mu nu is zero. Uh, something must go wrong. And so, so uh, this condition maybe doesn't, is not satisfied. Uh, why is it not satisfied? Because I have produced a Kij here. I have bent this surface t equals zero to another surface in Minkowski spacetime. You can just check your plotting skills to draw the graph, the graph of this function, right? So you've deformed the surface. And in, this introduces extrinsic curvature. And this extrinsic curvature will be such that r will not be in L1. r, the integral of r will be not finite. And uh, so let, let's check this, right? So let's check this. I have a formula for Kij here. So uh, I only need the radial component. So this is 1 half. Uh, well, there will be di, dr, and r twice. And there will be Christoffels times, times the n. But the Christoffels go to zero, so maybe they're not that important. Uh, so let's look at this term here. Well, the Christoffels of this metric actually are easy to work out, right? So they'll be of order 1 over r squared just from this, right? So because the derivative of this metric, so whatever n does, this is order of 1 over r square. And 1 over r square is very good, just you can integrate it, it square, right? Because now this condition that integral of r is small than infinity, because this formula means that the k square, integral of k square should be finite. Okay? So integral of k square should be finite. So let's see what is the normal vector here. Uh, well, if you know a little, if you have some experience, you can just read this from this term. But if you don't, let's do this calculation. Well, so if a equals 0, then the uh, normal would be uh, uh, just 1, 0, 0, right? So uh, this, we're in Minkowski, t equals 0. So this is the d over dt met metric. So f for large distances, everything goes to Minkowski, so n should be like dt, and uh, there'd be some lower order terms. Well, just I know what the result of the calculation is, so I just let me just add this to you, and uh, plus maybe things which decay, right? So this doesn't have to be exactly one, but it's going to be the leading order d over dt plus a radial component. Uh, how do I determine the normal vector? Well, I'm requiring that g. Well, the space-time metric, actually, G. So this would be, in this case, the Minkowski metric. So eta of d over dr and of the normal vector should be 0. The scalar product of the normal vector to a tangent vector should be 0, right? So let's calculate this with this metric. So, uh, well, because I have uh, only the scale, the uh, so this is eta r mu and mu. So if I use this guess that this is going, how it's going to look like, then there's going to be eta r t n t. Uh, what else? 
and plus, right, and plus eta r r and r. Well, this is actually exact if I know that there are no more terms, but this one is about one. Eta r t is minus one. Uh, eta r r, no, well, nonsense. Eta r t, well, actually, I should go in tau coordinates, so sorry about this. Okay, this should be d tau. Okay, this, this is correct, this is. Good, so eta r tau, this is here, right? Uh, and normally this comes with a factor two, so this is a over two square root of r. Well, eta r r, this is about one. Right? It's a leading order, it's one. So this is about one. So, and this should be zero, so I can read and R from this, right? If I approximate N tau by one and lower order terms, I'm going to get N R is minus this, right? So minus A two square root of R. So this is the index up plus lower order terms. Index down will be obviously the same. And I want to calculate K R R. So this is, if I just keep the asymptotics, one half of dr of what I just calculated here, minus a over two square root of r, plus lower order terms. Uh, okay, I should be able to differentiate this, right? The two, the two, uh, it's, it's one over eight maybe, the minus will go away. A over R three halves, something like that. Yeah, no. I forgot. Uh... Okay, this one is okay. Good. So now it's okay. Good. Yes. Say it, say it again. Yes. In lower values, just not in upper values. No, but to leading order it is. Yeah, that's a good point, right? If I'm lowering indices, I have to. I normally, if I did the calculation correctly, I would have to take into account this. But this goes to zero, so the leading order behavior is correct. Yeah. So the question was, this formula is approximate because. Uh, uh, I have the index up, I have to lower, but lowering with the space-time metric, so there might be some other stuff coming here, but good. So we see that, well, the norm of k square is certainly going to be louder than this, so uh, whatever a constant uh, times uh, uh, r to power 3. And uh, integral of k square is going to be louder than integral of uh, R3 of, or say, R louder than R because we're only working in large distances of uh, constant times R3. Uh, in three dimensions, this is infinite, right? Because you have an R square from the measure when you go to spherical coordinates, so you're integrating one over R from infinity to get logarithmic divergence, okay? So the lesson of this exercise uh, we, is that when you're defining asymptotic flatness and you are in a space-time setup, not only you have to be careful about what the metric does, but also what the extrinsic curvature does, okay? And this factor one-half is uh, showing up all the time. So if I didn't put a one-half in my silly coordinate system, but just some general alpha, I will get that everything is swell if the 
Exponent here is smaller than one half. If it's larger, we get infinite mass, actually minus infinite because of this sign, which is weird, but okay. And, uh, well, okay. So this is, uh, uh, the lesson is the decay of Kij matters. And to understand properly how this works, we really need to go to the space-time picture. So I would, I've been cheating and doing initial data, but you really, <coughs> sorry, need to go to the space-time picture. Yes? How do you know there's no cancellation? I don't. Well, no, actually I know. Because if there was a cancellation, uh, integral of r would have been finite, then I would get a mass which, no, does it work? <laughs> well, so whatever cancellations there are, I mean, what, what could happen, right? Okay, so if r was, suppose this thing was positive and still canceled so that the integral is finite, then you could use Riggs theorem that the mass must be finite, okay? So good. So therefore, whatever cancellation there are, they will not help you here. Uh, right. So, so what I would need to do and to make it completely, I would need to check that the other components of Kij follow faster, which is the case. So this is the dominant term. And then if you look at this, I don't know, good. Well, in any case, uh, I get a negative mass. So if it doesn't worry you, it doesn't worry me. <laughs> and uh, I will show you a theorem which says that if Kij, we will prove a theorem if Kij uh, falls off faster, uh, namely like minus alpha minus one with alpha larger than one half, then this problem will never occur. The mass will be well defined as a space-time notion, right? not only as a surface, but in a space-time notion, yes. Uh -huh. Say it again. So this one? This one? Uh, the vector dr is tangential to my surface. The surface is t equal constant, a tau equal constant, right? So the, the new surface is not t equal constant, because t equal constant would be just the previous one. The new surface is tau equal constant, right? And then dr is tangent to the surface, and uh, so that's the condition, okay? Yes? Why so? <laughs> it's just a simple coordinate transformation in uh -huh. the T coordinate. Why is so sensible the, the result? Is, is, <laughs> yes. I don't know. So it, is, it's weird. Uh, this example was, uh, is, you know, just meant to per make you perplexed and to think that this idea must doesn't make any sense, right? <laughs> Good. Uh, and so the point is that the asymptotic is delicate. The asymptotic should be faster than one half and then you'll be fine. And then we're going to prove this right away. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. So the condition that you have with dr and n being normal, so that if I write it says that n lower r is actually zero. So how are you getting a non-zero result? Uh, so let, let me do this again, right? So this would be Minkowski, but now uh, 
the, well, you're still in Minkowski, but the surface is, if A equals zero, D over D tau would be D over D T. So this would be the usual normal vector in Minkowski to the slice T equals zero. But because we're not, uh, then we're looking at the slice tau equals zero, then there are correction terms. So there'll be an n tau term here, which you should believe me goes to one. I don't want to do the calculation because it will take me another five minutes. Maybe I should have done the calculation and it would take taken me less time than questions. But <laughs> in R as a one form, not as a vector. That's here, here's, a, here's a vector, right? So here I have a vector. And the formula, therefore, if I set this to zero, I get this with an index up. And I have to lower it. But I lower it with this metric. And this metric has a one as a leading holder term and a correction. And that's why I wrote more or less. Because there'll be lower order terms, which I ignore. I just want to know the leading order asymptotics. No, it's, it's lower order. You'll get lower order terms. Maybe we, we do this calculation together later. Any other questions? Good. So you're all suitably perplexed. And let me show you worse. I, normally, I wouldn't do this because it takes a little time and we want to go on, but somebody asked me, can you make a time-dependent ADM mass? Because uh, obviously mass is conserved in physics, so if it's useful, it should be conserved. So if I take different slices, I should get the same number. Well, I can write in Minkowski a slicing of Minkowski where each slice has a well-defined mass, but changes in time. Right? So this is the next example. You just take t is equal to uh, 1 plus a square root, of course. What else? Let me just check that I have it right so that I don't have to repeat the calculation. But I think that's the right formula. Yes. OK. Let's, let's calculate. Right? So still, the, the metric is eta, so the Minkowski metric. And, well, the only thing which matters is the TR sector. So, so it's minus dt squared plus d r squared. And just to save chalk, I'm not going to write what ha happens here. But you're welcome to, to do well, uh, angular stuff. Good. So now I have to do my calculation again. Minus, so t is, well, actually directly here. Uh, tau plus a tau root r square plus dr square plus the angular stuff. Good. So let you know. Maybe let, let me just write it like that. So there's a d tau term, which is multiplied by one plus a square root of r. And let me just expand immediately, right? So, so I get the d tau square is just by applying d here and squaring. So I get some of kind of funny asymptotics here. Good. But square. Good. And then there will be a term uh, which is a cross term from. Let me do it carefully because otherwise we'll get it wrong. Okay. So d tau times 1 plus a root over plus tau times the differential of this. So a over 2 square root rho uh, r dr. Everyone agrees? And the square. So d tau times this plus tau times the differential of this, which is square root gives me a 1 half. So thank you. <laughs> That's dr square. Good. And now I'm going to look only at tau equal uh, constant. 
So let me just ignore the cross terms and the, these terms. So there'll be something d tau square, which I don't care, plus something d tau dr, which I don't care, plus dr square uh, is coming with a 1 from here and a square from this, right? So 1 plus tau square a square over 4r, 0 square. And now let me just to make things clear. This is the angular part, okay? So if you look at tau equal constant, this is gone, this is gone. This is a perfectly fine asymptotically flat metric. What is the mass? Well, we can just read it. It's twice, I mean, this coefficient is twice the mass, right? So the mass is, well, positive this time, I think. If I have my signs correct, do I have my signs correct? I have, I have a minus, yeah. So actually it's become negative now. So the mass is a minus tau square a square over eight. So tau is our new time. So we have a perfectly defined asymptotically flat metric, right? Just it looks like Schwarzschild up to lower order terms at every tau, right? But the mass changes in time. Good. So now you should be, as I said, perplexed square. And now let's therefore think that this uh, idea of defining mass using only the Ricci scalar was stupid. We need to do something better. So let's go to the space-time picture. And uh, let's see, so where do I erase? Don't think I need this. Ah, doesn't hurt. But we're, we're starting chapter two of this course, which is the space-time picture. Good, so I'm going to erase, so let's make a tabula rasa here. Uh, while I'm raising, can stretch, relax, go for a cigarette. Uh, and uh, try to summarize what we've done so far, right? So we introduced the notion of mass based on Cauchy data. Made perfect sense, but starts being a little dangerous if you start thinking about space-time. And since uh, general relativity is not only about initial data sets, but also about space times, we need really to go back to square one and figure out how to define uh, something which has a feeling of the mass in uh, general relativity. So, Let's go even one step back and let's ask, uh, well, what about uh, field theory in general? So we'll talk about something another called that Bob Wald calls another charges. And I think he will explain you tomorrow that whatever I told you was wrong. <laughs> and he has a better way of understanding that, which is certainly fine with me. But uh, so the question is, right, so uh, is there some conserved quantity associated with Uh, space-time flows. So, 
So this would be, the argument would be as follows. Uh, there's something called energy in mechanics. And if you've done another theorems in classical mechanics, uh, you know the conservation of energy is either a, a trivial calculation or a complicated argument saying that there is invariance under translation in time so that you, from this you get the result, right? So, uh, in other words, the energy in mechanics has something to do with invariance under changes, under motion in time. And, uh, well, here we are in a field theory on a manifold. We don't really know what, means, what it means to uh, move in time. So the best thing we can do is just we give ourselves a vector field on the manifold, and we start moving along this vector field. Okay, so we take a x, a vector field on the manifold. So now this is on space-time, right? So on space-time, forget all the nonsense with initial data. Uh, uh, and so the equivalent of moving in time in classical mechanics would be flowing along this vector field. So certainly we'll have introduced something like that. And now suppose we have a Lagrangian field theory. Or we have a Lagrangian, which depends. And for simplicity, I'm going to get to talk about Lagrangians, which depend upon only upon field and its first derivatives. And you're going to say, OK, good, go ahead. But we are clever. We already know that general relativity, you can get it from the Hilbert Lagrangian. Depends upon two derivatives. <laughs> so don't bore us with this. Well, you can repeat what I'm saying with more derivatives, but it's more complicated. And I just make a quick and dirty trick <laughs> to uh, get Einstein's theory in, uh, in this form. Uh, so Lagrangian field theory, and I'm going to require that uh, uh, this is, by the way, this should be a density. So that's not only a function, but a, a, a density. Right? So density. So you should think of this as square root of that g over r, if you could, uh, over 16 pi, maybe. So the density part is here. Right? And uh, in fact, you can write uh, Einstein's theory like that if you use the, uh, the metric and the connection as independent fields. So that would be one way of doing this, right? So, so if you look at this as a, a Lagrangian of, which depends upon the metric, well, in this case, no derivatives, but who cares in principle? And gamma and d gamma, then set certainly of this form, right? So I'm going to ask uh, for geometric invariance. So the Lagrangian takes the same form no matter what coordinates you use. Right, so this is an example, right? So this one, no matter what coordinate system you use, it's going to be the same algebraic expression of g, dg, in this case, no dg, of gamma and dg, d gamma, right? You write it in local coordinates, that's an explicit form, no matter what coordinates you use. An example which doesn't work would be, uh, 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 so, so example is, so it's equation one today, right? And non-example would be, uh, so the Maxwell Lagrangian, for example, which would be probably one over four pi or something like that. I never know the coefficients, but so f, so g alpha beta, g mu nu, f alpha mu, f beta nu. Well, this is the Maxwell field. So you're saying, well, of course, this looks the same in every coordinate system. Uh, well, if you think of this as being a function of g and f, yes. 
if you think of this as being a function of f only, no, because in Minkowski coordinates, suppose you're in Minkowski space-time, Minkowski coordinates you had once and minus once and things like that here. But if you, oops, that G. But if you go to spherical coordinates, you're going to get R squares all over the place, right? R from the inverse matrix and sine square theta and minus one over sine square theta, right? So this is not geometric. If you look at this as a function of A and dA, well, obviously, F alpha beta is d alpha A beta minus d beta A alpha. It's going to become geometric if you couple it to Einstein equation, and then you have a Lagrangian dependence on the metric, its derivative, and so forth. Right? So this is the uh, geometric invariant. And there is an elementary fact that uh, if you say define something which Bob calls the Noether current, theta mu, is defined and depends upon a vector field x, is uh, okay. So dl over d uh, phi alpha over mu, the lead derivative of the fields phi a. So I didn't tell you what the indices a are. But they can be anything, right? So if you just do the Palatini, so the phi i will be g mu nu's and the Christoffels, right? So this is a collective index which describes all indices. If you throw in the f's, then the phi, phi a will also have the a's. Good, and so this is minus uh, the Lagrangian times x mu. Uh, then, the divergence is zero. So this is like, like my claim that if you calculate this, then the divergence of this nether current is zero. Uh, so a lot of you know here that if you have a vector field with zero divergence, it's useful because it gives you, uh, you can use Stokes theorem and obtain some kind of conservation law. So uh, the conservation law is actually a very dangerous uh, and overused term in this context because what you're going to get, I'm going to do the calculation. It's for, sorry for boring those of you who already done this calculation 100 times, then you get some kind of flux. You get a balance low between energy at one time and compared with another one and some fluxes. This is the right thing. And that doesn't have to be a conservation involved because things can leak. Right? So talking about thinking immediately that this implies conservation of anything is actually a stupid thinking. Don't do this. Uh, for example, this will give us uh, the law of uh, energy loss by gravitational radiation, which is obviously not a conservation law. Right? It's saying that the mass is not conserved, it's actually decreasing. Right? So, so saying that this is a conservation law is a, a bit, uh, well, it's not a great idea. Any case, we have this formula, and the proof is uh, just two lines, so I can't resist the pleasure of doing this. So let's just calculate this, right? Now, if you calculate it in a, a brute force way, it's actually not two lines. Then this is, becomes annoying, especially since I didn't tell you what this lead derivative does. But, uh, well, uh, the idea is first to use a coordinate system where uh, the vector field x is as simple as possible, namely, uh, say, the pointing along one direction with coefficient 1. So, uh, so you'd ask me why did I use 1 and not 0? Well, it's just to confuse you, but also not to think. You'd, I don't want you to think that this is necessarily energy. Because if I put d over dx zero, then it would be time. And I will prove you something about energy. 
but this will not apply to anything else. Well, this applies also when this is a translation. So one would be the one co first coordinate along. But this could be also a rotation. Right? So we have a rotation. You call this coordinate one, and the argument I'm doing here applies. Right? Good. So, uh, well, can I always do this? I let you think about this. The answer is almost always, and you can try to figure out why almost always and what's the almost here. Yeah? But the almost is good enough because if you can do it almost always, by continuity, you can do it always. So uh, it's, it's true, it's true. <laughs> it's not a joke. <laughs> uh, OK, so anyone can tell me when can you not do this? Yeah, the vector field has a zero, right? So a vector has a zero, no matter how hard you try, you're not going to find a decent coordinate which does this, right? So, good. So you prove this for any vector fields which have no zeros. And then by continuity, if this is an identity, you can just approximate a vector field which has zero by vectors which don't. No. <laughs> no, no, they are index theorems, right? No, but what you can do, you can do something very silly. Uh, if you have a vector field which has a zero, uh, you can write it as sum of two vector fields, neither of them having zeros. This, is, this you can always do locally, right? But if you can do it locally, this expression is linear in, in my vector field, so if it's true for any of them, then. Good. Anyway, so we take a vector field which looks like that, calculate this divergence, right? So d mu of dl over d phi a over mu. OK, so if x is d over d1, in any recent decent field theory, the lead derivative is just the partial derivative. So let's accept this. And then we have uh, so d phi a over dx1 here minus uh, the Lagrangian times delta mu1. Good. So this something that Mr. Leibniz invented. Uh, I think this created uh, a, a first Brexit, at least scientific one, right, where the Brits uh, stopped collaborating scientifically with Europe because ne Newton said, I invented this, so we don't talk to any Germans anymore, and this was 400 years or so. So, uh, uh, so in any case, there's this Leibniz rule, which says that we have a term like this times time this, and then we have this time d mu acting on, on dx mu dx1. So let me continue. So this is the first term. And the second one is minus, well, derivative of the Lagrangian in the direction one. And that's it, right? So, well, let me just work on this term. Uh, and that's where my geometric invariance condition happens. L has the same form no matter what coordinates you use, right? So uh, if I had a stupid theory, I change coordinates, the Lagrangian will start depending upon the coordinates. And the hypothesis here tells me that in these coordinates, the Lagrangian still depends only upon the fields and their derivatives, okay? So that's what happens here. So, so let me call this star, and star is then, well, I have to differentiate L with respect phi a d phi a over dx1 plus derivative of L over d phi a 
of mu d2 phi a over dx1 dx mu, right? So there's something important I should have written. If the field equations are satisfied, okay, so. Because I have a variational theory, so this is equal to that if the field equations are satisfied, right? And there is a minus here. So this cancels with this one. And this is obviously the same uh, as this one. Okay. So that's as easy as that. Nothing. Uh, uh, as I said, if you worked in any coordinates, wrote down this lead derivative in a terrible way with derivatives of x, of everything, uh, you'll get there, but would be a little more work. Good. So what's the bottom line of this? Uh, so before I draw the bottom line, uh, for, for some of you who are not that familiar with integration on space-time and stuff like that, uh, so let me recall you the Stokes theorem, the way I've been taught it, uh, that I was told. Uh, they used to teach it in Warsaw some many years ago, uh, which says that if you have a region omega, then integral over of omega of d mu theta mu is equal integral of a boundary of theta mu times some funny forms. And these forms are, well, actually, I should write here d, uh, say d, uh, OK, whatever the dimension is, right? So dx0 times dxn. If you don't like integrating forms, and I'm sure that you don't see what I wrote here, <laughs> which is good, <laughs> then you think of this as just whatever you use to integrate. So this is this. And I have to tell you what this these mu's are. So, well, I, I, it's kind of the thing that you learn in calculus in high dimensions, but it becomes confusing uh, when you have a silly signature like Minkowski space time. Because this is, uh, you can think of this as theta mu times the normal with indices down, okay, and some measure d mu of d omega, whatever this is. So this is what it is. This is the normal, but with the indices at the right place. So you have to be careful what a normal in a conormal, because it's down, is in differential geometry. If you don't want to think, you just uh, say that ds mu is the contraction uh, with, of the coordinate form with the vector uh, ds mu. In other words, ds0 would be uh, dx1 times dxn. Uh, dx1, because this is an anti-symmetric operation, then you're going to get a minus sign here, dx0 times dx2. This contraction eats up the one index and so forth. Okay, so this is uh, a formal formula. No, not, not here, not here. My, my, uh, thank you for pointing this out. Because so what Hamid is saying that, uh, well, if you're integrating on a manifold, this looks like a very stupid formula because I don't have globally defined objects. So how, how is it possible that this makes sense? And uh, 
The reason why this makes sense is that I assume that my Lagrangian is a, not a function, but a density. Right? So this is a density. And let me just show you the formula if I was working with functions, right? So if I was working with functions, so uh, if theta mu is square root of g times a vector field, then how does this formula look like? Integral of a d omega uh, y mu, and maybe an absolute value if I'm in space time, at g y mu uh, ds mu. And then this is the, the forms you were thinking about. So maybe you want to call this your surface form if you want to, but I use these ones. Then this is the divergence of theta, right? So d mu of square root dead g y mu. And I can divide it by square root of the g and put in it square root of the g here and dx0 with dxn. And now this formula makes perfect sense. If you remember that this is the same as the covariant derivative of the vector field y mu, okay? So, sorry for those of you who know this very well, but if you don't, then this partial derivatives formula, when theta is a density, is the same as this geometric formula, where now these are things which you can integrate globally because they have good uh, transformation properties. Good. So, now that I convinced you that this is uh, geometric, because uh, that's actually the main aim of what I'm doing, is let's see what we get out of this. Well, so start thinking about a region which looks like that. We have a surface sigma 1, a surface sigma 2. And in fact, let me just do it in three dimensions right away. sigma 1, sigma 2. Uh, as this is the interior is the omega, and this boundary is something I call tau. And you can think of this as being time, and this is space, but you don't have to. This could be angles. My vector can be just a rotation, or a boost, or, or something else. So just think of a region like that. And in fact, this region has nothing to do with the vector x anyway. So uh, a priori, you can choose it adapted, but you don't have to. And so this divergence theorem is telling you that uh, if you integrate, well, integral over omega, omega of the divergence of mu, well, this is obviously 0, then this is integral of the d omega of theta mu ds mu. So if I call the integral, so let me just write it in four pieces, integral of a sigma 2, theta mu ds mu, plus integral over uh, sigma 1 ds mu, plus integral over tau ds mu so now let's see just for fun let's call this one uh, h of x and sigma 2 okay. so this is uh, by definition h is Hamiltonian obviously or energy or something like that so this global thing, this integral, and depends upon the surface and depends upon the vector field x, right? So I didn't write the vector field explicitly, but theta depends upon x, right? So this is uh, h. Now here, there's a question of orientation, because if I really think about a space-time domain, 
and let's for the moment do this, then this, the normal is pointing this way, and here, when you do this Tox theorem, you always have to say in which direction you have the orientation. So then this one will be, if I decide that this is plus, then this one will come with a minus. So this one is H of X sigma one with a minus because of the orientation. And this one is some kind of flux. So this is, we call this phi of X and tau. I could call it still the Hamiltonian because it's the same, but it has more uh, flavor of a uh, flux than uh, energy. So, good. So this is uh, what, my, what the divergence theorem tells me that I have, if I think about moving my initial data surface in time, then I have a, some kind of ba energy balance. Whatever energy I have here, is equal the one I've put in minus whatever I've lost with this flux here, right? So energy of x sigma 2 is energy of x sigma 1 minus the flux. So is it, do I have it right? Yeah, I think so, minus the flux. So this was a, an exercise which you must have done in your elementary field theory in Minkowski space-time. You do this for a scalar field in Minkowski space-time and get conservation of the standard energy. And conservation, you'll obtain conservation when you go with this surface to infinity and your fields go to zero, right? Because this theta which has vanished somewhere now, is it? Yeah, I just erased it. I'm going to write it again. So theta mu is dl over d phi a mu, li derivative of phi a minus x mu l. All right, this depends upon your fields. So if you take uh, Maxwell fields at large distances, Lagrangian will be zero, this will be zero, there'll be no flux and you'll get conservation of energy. And indeed, some cases you get conservation lows out of it. But not always, you get, you're going to get uh, the troutman bondi flux formula, if we do it in general relativity uh, later in this lecture or maybe tomorrow. So, good. So where, where do we stand now? So this is quite general. And uh, let's do an application to general relativity. So this would be paragraph 2.2. Uh, the general relativity with a background metric. Okay, so we already saw that, well, you can do general relativity, a variational principle, Hilbert Lagrangian, second order, doesn't apply here. We could do it uh, general relativity, Palatini, Lagrangian, first order. We could do this here, but uh, it's kind of more complicated. So there's one way of doing general relativity, first order, uh, uh, as a field, the fields being uh, just symmetric. And so the question is, what is a Lagrangian, uh, which depends upon G and DG? And the answer is uh, simple. Well, if you, have, if you are working on a manifold with a single coordinate patch, then you just say, well, the calculation we did yesterday or outlined yesterday, the Ricci scalar times the G is the divergence of something uh, plus a Q, which was quadratic in DG. So if you want to do weak field general relativity where the background is Minkowski, you know that variational principles don't care about divergences. So this term, if the field equations are satisfied from this Lagrangian, 
they will also be satisfied from this Lagrangian. So, but this is kind of geometrically ugly. And a little better way of doing this, it says, well, let's use a second metric on our manifold uh, to make this divergence covariant. So the uh, idea is to have two metrics, two metrics, uh, G and G bar. And we can write, because this is a density, uh, as a divergence, uh, again, a, a, di a normal divergence, this is the same business as before. Right? If you're working with densities, you can, a normal divergence is the same as a covariant one in, some, in a precise sense made precise, plus uh, something which, and let's divide by 16 pi, plus uh, whatever remains, which now depends upon G dg, this background metric g bar dg bar, and is quadratic in, in the derivatives, right? In dg and dg bar. Or another way of saying this is just each time you have a partial derivative of the metric, when you write out this expression, you replace it by a covariant one to the other metric plus a tensor, which is the difference, and you do this calculation, okay? So I'm certainly not going to do this calculation. This is essentially the same calculation I outlined the previous time, but then you end up with a Lagrangian, which only depends upon the metric in its first derivatives. Good, so now we have that. It looks swell, but of course, I spent a lot of time explaining you that if you have some exterior, some, if you take the Maxwell fields in Minkowski space time, that's not an invariant Lagrangian because you have an extra structure, the Minkowski metric. So here, this is not an invariant Lagrangian because you have an extra structure, the G bar metric, right? So change coordinates. Uh, uh, doesn't quite work, uh, and the main fact here is that if x is a killing vector of the background, so Lx of g bar is zero, then, and the equations are satisfied, right, so, and the field equations are satisfied, so field equations in vacuum, or maybe you have some more fields than fields, then you get that st this is still true. So in other words, you can still use this, but not for any vector field anymore. Uh, you can do it for vector fields which are killing vector fields of your background. But for us, if you are in asymptotically flat space time, that's good enough, right? We have a metric. So what is the background? I'm I'm, if I'm looking at asymptotically flat metrics, I'm not going to take as a background the anti sitter metric. I mean, you can try, but that will not be very constructive. You should just take the asymptotic Minkowski metric, right? So you have a flat metric. You have one metric, which is yours, the real one. And you have one which you get asymptotically. So we have a G which goes to eta, the Minkowski metric, as r goes to infinity, uh, and you take this one as your background. Right? So this metric has as many killing vectors that you want, and for every one of these, you get this divergence-free nether current, and you get this energy balance low. Right? So now the question is, is this actually a conservation law? Is this only a balance law or something like that? That's what we're going to try to analyze now. Uh, good. So now there are two things which happen here. First, the divergence is zero, and H of x sigma is a boundary integral. So this is of uh, some expression. Uh, 
So let me write this geometrically first so that, you're, that this is manifestly geometrically invariant. What are these forms ds alpha beta? Well, ds alpha beta is just d alpha contracted with d beta contracted with the volume form. Uh, and, uh, and this boundary sigma is understood in an obvious way if you're looking at a bounded region, and it's understood in a limiting process if you're looking at a general region. So I think it's probably a good point to stop here. I'm going to write down the formula for what u alpha beta is uh, now or next time, next time, okay? So I write you the formula for u alpha beta. But the bottom line of this is that these Noether charges become integrals at infinity, and this is a miracle. I mean, there's no reason that this should happen, and uh, Bob has probably a, a nice way of explaining why this miracle takes place, uh, but uh, this is some kind of miracle. Uh, and so these things are going to reproduce, if you took x to be the vector d over dt, you get ADM mass out of this. So, and this is what I told you. I had this Mickey Mouse way of writing what the ADM mass is. Here's the long way, right? But it took me a whole lecture to get there. So uh, if you take x equal a translation, you get something called the ADM momentum. I'm going to write you what it is. If you take x to be a rotation, so something like xi dj minus xj di, you're going to get uh, angular momentum. And there is one last interesting vector field, the boosts. This sign looks weird, but it's correct. This is a vector field generating boosts. And uh, there's a stupid name for this charge. It's called center of mass. Okay. So this is giving you the center of mass. But then, of course, you have all the questions that we asked about the ADM mass. Does it converge? So here we already know. We don't have to repeat this. Uh, the, the momentum, uh, it's going to converge if Kij is well behaved, exactly in the way we, I indicated before. So the mystery that Kij has to be just decay is hidden here. If you have, want to have a well-defined momentum, you need uh, extrinsic curvature tensor, which is well behaved. And these guys will uh, require more work. Uh, so, uh, so this we'll talk about next time. And let me also mention that uh, if you go with this boundary to infinity along uh, a nice asymptotic lat surface, you're going to get uh, this formula will give you conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, conservation of angular momentum, conservation of center of mass. If you go with, to the limb at infinity along null direction, this formula will tell you that there is something called the uh, troutman bondi mass. This is the mass for the gravitational wheel field in the radiation zone. And rather than having a conservation, you'll get a flat formula the mass, bondi troutman mass, is always decreasing. This flux integral will have a sign, and this is going to give you the theorem that energy can only be radiated away with gravitational waves. Thank you, and uh, let's continue tomorrow.